Hello and welcome back to season two of Fertility Talks, the Therapy Fertility Podcast. I'm your host, Renee Van Medin, and I'm so happy to be back hosting our second season. Each week, I'll be sitting down with a different guest and talking all things fertility. As always, our hope is that through this series, through honest conversation and information, we can strip away some of the stigma that sometimes goes hand in hand with infertility and fertility treatment in Ireland. Today, I'm really honored to have in studio uh, Stephanie McNamara, who is a primary school teacher and a therapy fertility patient, who's going to be sharing a bit of her own fertility journey with us. So, Steph, thank you so much for being here, for being willing to share your very personal, very private journey with us and with all of our listeners. And I know it will be very helpful to so many people out there. So thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, So tell me a bit about yourself. So I am started my journey with therapy last year but I started my journey with endometriosis really really young I was like 13 Mm -hmm. um when I first started showing signs um I thought everything was fine pretty much for years um I kind of coexisted with it and and I mean I had some surgeries and things like that but I didn't know there was an impact on my fertility for a long time um my husband and I started trying for a baby just before our wedding. We got pregnant immediately. Mm -hmm. We have a little girl who, Mia, who's two. Um, So I didn't realize that something called secondary infertility even existed. Mm -hmm. Um, When Mia was about nine months old, we decided to start trying again. And we just kind of assumed that because the endometriosis had been quiet for a couple of years because we'd been so lucky with Mia, everything was going to be fine. And it wasn't. Mm. Um, so we had a very, very tough year, year um, 13 months, where we had four pregnancy losses. Um, and that's what led us to seek out some help with therapy. And we're really glad we did. <laughs> So growing up, you suffered with endometriosis and, you know, you had various surgeries, um, Mm -hmm. interventions. At at no point did anyone ever say to you that you might have trouble conceiving or... No, at no point. And I did ask the questions Mm -hmm. growing up and I felt a little bit almost like I was fobbed off. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, you're young, you don't need to be thinking about that right now. Actually, if I had gotten the right answers, then there might have been something I could have done. Maybe I could have freezed eggs. Maybe I could have prevented some of the the damage that was done later on with later surgeries. Um, I have a lot of scar tissue and that caused us to have three consecutive ectopic pregnancies. And I wonder now down the line if I had had the right support and advice early on, even though I was very young, would would the outcome have been different? Mm. So I suppose you you very miraculously became pregnant naturally yeah and went through a pregnancy there were were there any issues on the pregnancy not really no no it was it wasn't an easy first pregnancy Mm. but I mean she was fine we had a we had a tough but normal pregnancy and a tough but normal delivery Mm. um and endometriosis is a is a kind of funny in that Whenever your hormones are heightened, it'll do one of two things. It'll either completely go off the rails or it'll quiet down. And in pregnancy, in pregnancy for me, it completely disappeared. Do you know, I've heard a lot of people. no symptoms at all. It was incredible. I know. I I actually know a lot of people who who suffer really badly Mm. and have said the only time that they've ever been completely free of any pain. Yeah. I mean, obviously, there's the the other pain, the pains of being pregnant. Yeah, but you know, from those symptoms is is actually when they're pregnant. Yeah, and the symptoms, like I think as well, people hear the word endometriosis a lot, and they don't realise that it is quite debilitating. Um, like I would have had my first operation when I was the year of my leaving, so sixteen, seventeen. Um, and my, the endometriosis affects me in that I get plaques of it growing on my stomach and my bowel but it also causes cysts on my ovaries and that was the main problem for me and so I've had a lot of surgeries where they would have to remove the cysts or one or other one or both of my ovaries would have um, gone into torsion they would have twisted so because of all the surgeries I've had there's a huge amount of scar tissue now in my tummy but nobody ever had a long-term conversation with me this is what the effects of this are going to be. It was very much, this is how we're going to manage this mm. currently, like right now. Um, 
and I think now that we're I mean I've no, I know now that there are different therapies there are different things that they can do for people that don't just involve straight away we're going to go in we're going to cut you open we're going to take it all out yeah. there are lots of things that they can do now before they get to that point mm. so hopefully the the girls who are 13 14 15 now who are starting to feel it they're starting to get the heavy periods and the pain and I mean I used to faint in school regularly just from blood loss and I, the cure for that when I was 13 was we'll put her on the pill mm. um which isn't ideal yeah they have ways and means to get around that now so hopefully things do improve but um my story wasn't straightforward in a lot of ways um and I think it would be different if it was to happen now yeah I hope so anyway it just seems completely crazy to me that no one ever had that conversation with you that this might have an impact on future fertility yeah yeah nobody had that conversation and nobody really looked into a bigger picture mm. um so I started I started going in and out to hospital when I was 13 I was 24 when I saw a proper endometriosis specialist in the public system um and that specialist did sit me down and say look this this putting you on the pill that your GP did is, is not the ideal way to treat this. Um, in fact, long term, that's possibly going to cause damage because it's a risk factor for things like ovarian cancer down the line. We're going to stop all of this um, and we're going to try to focus on just managing it in other ways. Yeah. Um, that was the first clue that I had that there were different things that you could do. Um, there were better ways of managing a condition that really debilitates your mm. life. It, it dictated my activity levels, my uh, food that I would eat, places that I could go. Um, even down to like it had an impact on my college exams. I had a cyst burst the day before one of my exams in college. And I remember like being in the back of an ambulance thinking of all the times that this could happen. <laughs> And then realizing that's not a normal reaction to this situation. <laughs> it shouldn't be a normal thing for me to be in the back of an ambulance the night before an exam. Um, so, yeah, the journey, the fertility journey certainly wasn't straightforward, but having our daughter seemed to go s so, so well, smoothly, so yeah. smoothly. Mm -hmm. We didn't have any issues that we just presumed that it would be the same the second when time we around, tried yeah. around. Again. And I think what you said at the start is is so true. So many people have not heard about secondary infertility. Mm -hmm. Even I'm sure people, you know, that you've been talking to in the last year and people assume when you have one child and it seems straightforward that it's just going to happen again. Yeah, and that's where all of the kind of cliche comments come in as well. Oh, it'll be fine. Oh, it'll happen. Mm. Oh, just relax. Mm. You can relax all you want, but if if your tubes are blocked or if you have a significant problem, that's not going to work, you yeah. know? And it's not kind of the most helpful thing for people to say as well. Um, I think one of the most helpful things anyone ever said to me was, this is really, really rubbish. Mm. What can I do? Yeah. Um, instead of just, ah, sure, it'll be grand. It's not always grand and it certainly wasn't for us. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about, so when Mia was nine months old, that's when yeah, you started trying. Yeah, we started trying again. So when, when was this? What year? This was October 2020. Okay. Um, we started trying again um, and the negative pregnancy tests started to mount mm. each month. And I was thinking, gosh, this is strange, you know, like it was so fine before. Um, I didn't, I, I, I genuinely didn't think too much into it because I was like, oh, maybe it's just going to take a little bit longer. In early January of 2021, I found out that I was pregnant again um, and we were overjoyed. I just took it for granted everything would be fine. Um, my husband was at work and I made a little treasure hunt with clues around the house for him to like to tell him that we were expecting again. And the next week I went to my GP um, to book in the pregnancy with him. And I would have been about, I'd say, six and a half weeks at this mm. stage. Yeah, sick already because I get very glamorous hyperemesis. So I was lovely and sick already and uh, strolled into my GP without a care in the world and said, yeah, I'm pregnant. He said, how are you feeling? Um, and you could see by him, he kind of didn't like the look of me. Mm. And I said, I have a bit of a pain in my tummy, but I have that cyst that they found last year. So it's probably just that. 
And he said, actually, I'm quite concerned about you, like looking at you now, having felt your tummy, I think your pregnancy is ectopic. I'd never even heard of an ectopic mm. pregnancy. He sent me into the hospital. Even in the hospital, they were doing, um, they do beta blood tests mm. and they repeat those every 48 hours to make sure that those levels are doubling. So you don't get a definitive answer. Not for, and in some cases they'll repeat that test again. So it could be four, six days later before you actually know. And that was the case for me. Um, but even in that, I was still so naive, I suppose, that I thought, oh, it's going to be fine. Like it's just the cyst and a doctor in the hospital. And bearing in mind, this was the end of January 2021. We had just gone into a full lockdown. I was in the hospital on my own. Nobody could come with me. Nobody could even hold my hand in the hospital. Um, a doctor sat me down and said, I'm really, really sorry, but you're absolutely losing this baby mm. and we can't find where the pregnancy is at the moment. Um, there's a lot of inflammation in your stomach and we think that the pregnancy is stuck in your tube. And that was the first indication I had that, oh, oh my goodness, this really isn't OK. Um, he admitted me straight away and said, your life is at risk and that's our priority right now is that you're quite unwell. Um, you need to ring your husband and inform him, like tell him what's going on. And I was just so overwhelmed. And I still remember that doctor standing there and all, you know, fully PPE'd up and his eyes welled up. And he said, I'm so sorry that I can't give you a hug because you're here on your own. Um, so that part was tough in itself. But um, I was admitted and after a few days they found the pregnancy it was quite large and embedded right in the wall in my tube. Um, they treated me with an injection. It's actually a chemo drug that they give you. Um, they just do one dose usually. Um, some people need a second one later on but I, I was lucky and the first dose worked. I had to stay in hospital for about a week and then was able to go home. Um, you can't try again for another three months after having that treatment which was incredibly tough um but the toughest part was like that there were so many side effects and things that I didn't know I didn't know that I would still have hyperemesis even though I already knew the pregnancy was dying that we were losing the baby I didn't know that the injection that they'd given me would make me so sick um and would affect me for the whole three months afterwards um but most of all I didn't know about the emotional fallout mm. I didn't I didn't know um, how much it was going to affect me um, and my husband. Um, and what I found the hardest was that because of, because we live in Ireland and because of the way that a lot of people um, think and things like that, everybody waits until they're 12 weeks to tell anyone that they're mm -hmm. pregnant. So for us, we had to make phone calls to some of our nearest and dearest, telling them in the same sentence, we're pregnant, but we've lost the baby, mm -hmm. um, which was really, really hard. Um, had a, had people known, even just our closest family members, it would have meant that we could have just said, look, things are not good. Can you come and help? Can you come yeah. and mind the baby? Or can you, you know, or even just we don't need anything, but we're just letting you know. Mm. But um, there was a lot of heightened emotion, which was really, really hard to deal with as well. And dealing with all of this with a, a, a daughter who's only just turned one. Yeah, it was difficult. Um, it was made a little bit harder by the guilt mm. that nobody really talks about because you're suffering so much yourself. But the whole time as a parent, you're just thinking, I'm letting her down. Mm. I should be spending more time with her. I haven't played with her enough today. Mm. I, I ca Every day that I was in hospital, I would FaceTime her. But then I'd be crying afterwards mm. because I'd be like, look, I've seen her, but she's at home without me. And, and she doesn't understand. She doesn't understand that mom isn't coming home. You know, mm. so that was quite tough too. So when the three months were up, what what did you do next? We started trying straight away. Okay. Um, and I know that things, some people, that might not be the way that they would have dealt with it. But for us, we knew that we wanted to try again as soon as we could. And um, at that point, had you been advised to seek any no assistance? We had investigations. No. No advice like that at all. No reason why this not happened. at all. Okay. No, there was no real investigations into the why done. It was like this has happened. There is a high chance it might happen again mm -hmm. because once you have one ectopic pregnancy, your chances of having another double. So we had that conversation, but it was like, but sure, 
But they just you have to try to try yeah. again in three months. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we did. We got pregnant straight away. And again, pretty much bang on six weeks, I started getting a pain in my side. Um, the same side that I'd had most of the ovarian cysts on that, that we knew had scar tissue around it and things. So it wasn't altogether surprising, especially since we knew that our chances were higher of having another ectopic. Um, I went into the hospital straight away. Yeah, because um, you knew this time. Yeah, I just, I think even if the pain had been mild, I just knew something wasn't right. Um, I had noticed as well that my pregnancy test, I decided to treat myself this time to the fancy ones that give you a a time isn't and it so funny I that <laughs> everyone treats those as the fancy yeah, ones they the really, digital <laughs> well they really are um but it said one to two weeks mm. and I knew that I was at least four weeks pregnant so you knew that the, so I knew the hormone that, was lower, yeah, yeah yeah my hormone levels mustn't have been high enough so I went into the hospital and they did a quick scan and they saw an ectopic pregnancy straight away but we still had to do the beta tests wait the four days I was readmitted um I'd actually started to lose the baby myself mm. at that stage um so that's what they call expectant management when they don't have to give you the treatment and they just kind of watch and wait and make sure that everything goes okay and did you have to stay in hospital that time no okay. I stayed um for two nights that mm. time and once they were sure that I was well enough in myself and my beta numbers were going down they could see that the pregnancy was decreasing mm. Um, it sounds so cold to talk about it like that, but that's that's how they talk about it. Um, I was allowed to go home then and I was monitored. Um, the other side of it that I didn't know anything about was that those beta tests are not just done while you're in hospital. Mm. For the ectopic pregnancies, I spent about four weeks going in and out every two to four days for those blood tests. That in itself, I'm sure, is yeah. very difficult because that's the test you do to check for pregnancy. Yeah. Um, it became something that I just almost blocked out. It mm. became like a matter of course. Mm. Like, you know, if you stop in somewhere on the way to work for a coffee, yeah. I had to make it part of almost a routine mm -hmm. to be able to cope with it. Um, I was very lucky that when we tried again, I got pregnant again. But at this point, my GP said, I'm not happy that this is, that you're trying like this because I think it's dangerous. And has this nobody was the third time this was the third time and he at that point said has nobody talked to you about this and I said no and he said look you're it's the risk to you that I'm concerned about mm. because if an ectopic pregnancy ruptures you could die mm. um and this could happen you could, it could be the middle of the night your husband could be at work there could be nobody in the house with you I'm really worried about this mm. and I think that you need further investigation yeah. so when I went in to be admitted that time for the third ectopic pregnancy the doctor the consultant who came down to see me on the ward the day that I was being released I put those questions to him mm. um and it was the first time that I felt I had enough kind of presence of mind that I had my little notebook out and I said look I've got a few questions can I ever get pregnant this way do you think? I said, I know that you're not scanning me right now. I know that you can't give me all of the answers. What is your opinion? And he looked me straight in the eyes and said, no, I don't think you will. He said, I think statistically, this is a nightmare. And I don't think that you are going to be able to conceive without further help. So I said, OK, um, what investigations can you guys do? And they said very little. As a maternity hospital, we actually do very, very little unless you're acutely unwell. I think you need to think about fertility treatment. And it was the first time anyone had said that to me in a very long time. IVF had been mentioned when I was, you know, quite young, but it was me who mentioned it to a doctor and I was told, no, nah, you're too Don't young. Don't be it. worrying yeah. about it for now. Now I had a doctor come back to me and say, actually, you do need to do IVF. Um, you were very, very lucky to get pregnant in the first place. And it, it, it was just that it was pure luck. And I don't think that's going to happen again. So we started researching clinics online. Um, we had a recommendation for Dr. Kennedy from a friend of ours who'd used him in his previous clinic. Mm -hmm. um, and when we saw that they were opening therapy, I think I was probably one of the first emails that they received because I thought, no, do you know, I'd rather 
I'd rather go with a doctor that I trust now. Um, I'd just met too many doctors along the way who weren't honest enough. Mm -hmm. And what I needed was somebody who would give me the honest truth. So while we were waiting for our appointment for therapy, we found out that we were pregnant again. This was not, we hadn't been trying mm. that month. Um, this was coming into September 2021. And that was, I suppose, what you'd call a normal miscarriage. Mm. So that was our fourth consecutive loss in the year. Um, we had our first appointment at therapy and they recommended for us to have a hycosi scan which is where they put like fluid in and they check your tubes and, and your uterus and things and I remember thinking at the time if there is a scan that can check for these things why, why was wasn't I offered it before? yeah why years wasn't ago. years and years yeah. ago like I, I would have been a candidate for that when I was mm -hmm. 20 21 why didn't they check then yeah just to give when you they that knew yeah. I had issues they knew that I had adhesions. I mean, at one point, my bowel and my ovary were stuck together and they had to operate to separate them. Mm. Surely at that point, they should have gone, maybe we should check her fertility. Mm. But they didn't. So we had our hycosy done. And it's quite a quick and easy procedure. I was expecting when I heard, like when I read the description online and stuff and I had heard about it, I was expecting it to be an actual procedure. It was very much just like a normal. Like a scan. Internal scan, yeah. Um, and you're looking at the screen and um, Dr. Kennedy put the fluid in and you can see the fluid light up the screen. And he had told us beforehand that like the fluid will flow and it'll show up the tubes and stuff. When he, when the fluid went in, on the screen it literally just lay in the one position you could see it going in then we could see it going in and then it stopped it didn't go anywhere um it was like a line at the bottom of the screen mm. and he said okay we're going to go in and have a chat and i knew straight away that that wasn't normal yeah um before we even went in i was like uh oh mm -hmm. <laughs> what are we going to be told um but we had a very quick and straightforward conversation where he said look i think that IVF is the best way forward and in doing that we're going to bypass the tubes and hopefully really really significantly reduce the risk of you having another ectopic pregnancy and because you carried your first child well and you had a relatively healthy pregnancy we know that if we can get you that far things should be okay mm. now he was very much like I can't promise that but I can promise you that we will do our best to ensure that that happens so we started IVF the following month um we would have started it that day had we been able to. We were so keen. And what month was this in? This was the beginning of October okay. 2021. Mm -hmm. We started short protocol IVF. Um, so I, had, I, was, I was nervous, I think, about the injections because I'd never injected myself before, but I'd become so dulled to needles from having all the beta tests with the mm -hmm. ectopic pregnancies. Once I got the hang of it, it, it was actually quite easy it was it was bearable and they're tiny tiny they're needles. teeny tiny needles it was bearable um how yeah. did you find the medication affected you um I was definitely a little bit moodier and I'm quite level-headed mm. so there were a couple of times where like I remember one night I had texted my husband on the way home and said let's get a takeaway and I got home and he was like oh I'm not really bothered I genuinely <laughs> I tore that I, I burst into tears <laughs> burst into tears had a massive argument with myself, really, <laughs> and was like, I just need chips, okay? <laughs> and then when I calmed down, was like, oh, I think that could be the hormones, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and wonder. Um, but other than that, yeah, I was a little bit moody. I was, I suppose, a little bit bloated. Um, I had maybe two or three really emotional days mm. where I had a little cry and thought, this isn't fair. I don't want to have to do these injections anymore. Yeah. I'm really upset about this. When I spoke to people, they said that's totally normal. And if you weren't having those days, they'd be worried. Yeah, It's totally normal to have a moment to be able to say, this is rubbish. Yeah, This is really, really rubbish. But I still got on um, and kept going because all I kept thinking was that this is, this is our chance mm. and we have to do our best. And sure enough, we had our egg retrieval and we found out in the interim that I also had low AMH. So I didn't have as many eggs as they would hope for someone of my age. Mm -hmm. I'm 32 now. So um, my AMH was low, but it wasn't non-existent. 
Um, so we went ahead, um, we did ICSI after my husband's sperm analysis as well, which was normal, but just not amazing. So they wanted to give us the best chance possible. Mm-hmm. Um, our egg retrieval gave us 10 eggs. We ended up with two embryos. We, I reacted a little bit too much to the progesterone. So Dr. Kennedy did a freeze all on the embryos and I took a break from the medication and a couple of weeks later started again, went back in, had a frozen embryo transfer. So it just, it just delayed it for a couple of weeks Mm -hmm. really, um, which was fine because he explained to us that he could see by my hormone levels that I might not hold a pregnancy. And he was like, ultimately it's up to you. And we said, oh my goodness, we'd rather wait the three weeks and have a better chance. Absolutely. We did a frozen embryo transfer. And what date was that? That was November, the end of November, 2021, okay. uh, 28th of November. And after about five or six days, I started very glamorously puking and knew that the hyperemesis was kicking in already. Um, what I hadn't realized beforehand is that you still continue with your IVF medications Mm -hmm. right up until you have a scan with a good heartbeat and you know that there's a healthy baby in there. So I was still injecting and I was thinking, oh, sure, it must be the hormones. It must be this because I didn't want to hope. I was so, I think, almost devoid of emotion and devoid of hope at that stage that I was afraid that if I got attached to the idea that we might be pregnant again, that it would disintegrate and fall apart and and our dream would just be gone well i suppose when you're just trying to protect yourself when you've had so much grief and loss and pain in such a short amount of time you kind of don't want to hope yeah it's almost a defense mechanism Mm. if i pretend it's not happening if i pretend the worst isn't Mm. happening the worst isn't going to happen Mm -hmm. um we had they they I thought I wasn't going to test early, but I did. <laughs> everyone um, tests early. Everyone tests Anyone early. Anyone says that they don't <laughs> test early is a liar. <laughs> yeah, yep, absolutely. Um, about, I think I, I think I did well though. I think it was day nine or 10 and I was already That's, quite sick at, this sta- at that stage. It's pretty good to get to day nine or 10. Yeah. Um, like literally had morning sickness and then was like, maybe I'll take a pregnancy test. Yeah. And... Yeah, we got a positive result. We went in for our beta test. I'll I'll never forget going in because I went in, I was sitting down, they took my blood and there was a little knock on the door and I looked and Dr. Kennedy had poked his head in and he was like, Stephanie, I just, how are you feeling? And I said, a little bit nauseous. And he went, yes. (laughs) He was so excited. Um, It's like the only scenario in which someone would be like, woo, she's getting sick. Yeah, (laughs) he did a little jump and went, yes. And I was like, look, look, we're going to, wait I'll I'll be I was well um I had a well-trodden path to the early pregnancy unit at Mm. my maternity hospital at this stage and I said uh, the midwife I had had the same midwife in there by some stroke of luck for all of my losses Mm. and I said a beautiful woman called Neve who uh, like I owe the world to because she held me together during all of those admissions in COVID when nobody else could um I said I'm going I have I'm going in there next week for some betas And Dr. Kennedy said, look, let's just do a repeat one here and put your mind at ease. Come back to us in two days. Um, And that way you won't have to wait as long, which was really, which is really amazing. Um, And it just shows that even if you are somewhere like a fertility clinic that you think could be quite clinical, for want of a better word, there is such a human touch there. Um, I had a repeat beta and it had almost tripled. So we knew that the pregnancy was okay um for the time being Mm. even at that we couldn't hope um I have I had a number of early scans and no matter I think no matter how many early scans that you have I don't know will there ever be enough reassurance after having four consecutive losses um but this is our sixth pregnancy now and I'm 12 weeks and everything is perfect so far so we are gradually beginning to hope again it's amazing um how many people know so this time because we knew early on that everything was okay we talked about it and decided that the best thing for us to do 
was tell our closest family and friends straight away. Firstly, because should anything go wrong, you need that support. You need people around you. Not everybody. You don't need to go and, you know, post it on your Instagram if you don't want to. But certainly like our parents, Mm. um, our siblings and one or two of our best Mm. friends, we told as soon as we had that repeat beta result. Um, And I think if I think if we anything were to happen differently, we would still have done that. Um, If I was sitting here discussing our fifth consecutive loss, if this pregnancy hadn't worked out, I still would stand by that decision. I think that the waiting till 12 weeks thing might be fine for some people, but if if anything does happen, that you need more support with, it mightn't be a loss. It might be just that you're finding it difficult or your partner's finding it difficult. You need to be able to speak to somebody about it. Um, so we told... Um, We threw a little rainbow afternoon tea party in our house and told our parents and our siblings and um, we actually got our little girl to tell them, which was lovely. Um, She has a little bit of an awareness about what's going on. Yeah, how is she feeling about it? Well, we'll find out in August. (laughs) (laughs) We've bought her some picture books and she kind of has an idea. Um, She knows, you know, I can't jump on mommy because there's a baby in her tummy, but whether she actually realizes that that baby's going to come and live with us, I don't know. (laughs) She's going to get a rude awakening. She really is. It's a nice age gap though. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's not the age gap that we planned for, but she is a little bit older and she will have more of an understanding, which is good. Yeah. Um, when you were going through the losses, did anybody know at any stage? Um, my two closest friends knew. Mm. And we had to tell our parents for practical reasons. Mm. We needed people to to be in the house for us, maybe when neither of us could be there or to, to mind our toddler. Um, but other than that, no. Um, and it was really, really lonely. Mm. Um, grief is lonely at the best of times. But in the middle of a pandemic, when people kind of maybe aren't keeping in contact as much as they were before, the loneliness and the grief combined is very difficult. Um, And I think it can be hard for people outside of the situation to know what to say. Mm. Um, They they don't want to sound unfeeling or uncaring. They don't want to say the wrong thing. But saying nothing is definitely worse. That's what we found anyway. Um, There are people who know now who still haven't acknowledged it to us. Um, And they, that hurts more, I think. I think even if you don't know what to say, saying, I don't know what to say, but I'm really sorry, is enough. That in itself is really helpful, yeah. Yeah. And and it's never out of badness. It's never because someone's trying to hurt you. It's, It's always because we don't talk about this stuff enough. We don't talk about loss. We don't talk about grief. We don't talk about infertility. And people genuinely don't know what to say. They really don't. There's still such a taboo Mm. on miscarriage Mm. and pregnancy loss. Um, And it is until you're in it, you don't realize how pervading that is. Um, I remember coming into the house one day, I'd just come out of the hospital and pulled up in the driveway and my neighbor was going into her house. Um, and she said, how are you? You don't you don't look great. And I just blurted out, we've actually just had our fourth miscarriage. And she went, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. I, I don't even know what to say. And I said, no, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have blurted it out like that. I'm just a bit emotional. Um, and I got a text a couple of days later from her saying, we've actually just had a miscarriage, too. And I, I was so wrapped up that I didn't realize that there was even other people in the world experiencing mm-hmm. this right now. And there you are right next door. Mm-hmm. And it's so true. It's so true that we don't we don't talk about it. Um, my husband has experienced it in work where friends of his that he's worked with for 10, 12, 15 years are going through the same thing. But they didn't know that we were going through it and we didn't know that they were going through it until we got through it mm. um, and were able to talk about it. Um, there are people out there for you to talk about, like the maternity hospitals have fantastic um, bereavement teams. Mm. The bereavement midwives in my hospital sent me seeds to plant 
to remember our losses and rang me to make sure that everything was okay. Every couple of weeks, just a little check in. Um, they sent me recommendations of therapists if I needed to speak to somebody, which is wonderful. But sometimes what you really need is just the odd text from someone saying, I've heard, I'm really sorry. I know there's probably nothing I can do, but I just want to let you know that I'm here. Um, we had our family were quite practical about it, which was fantastic and sent us up food. And um, I mean, I remember ringing my mother-in-law and saying things aren't good again when we'd had, I think, our third loss. And within two hours, she was in my house putting the toddler to bed. And it's practical things like that, that like if she hadn't done that, I wouldn't have been able to go to bed early that night, to have a bath, to put a wash on. Mm. It's things like that, that you don't need to send flowers or anything like that. But sometimes somebody needing you, it could be as simple as somebody needing you to stick a wash on or load mm. the dishwasher. And they are helpful things that people can do for their friends and family mm. if they don't know what else to do, yeah. you know, because when you're in the depths of that kind of grief, even the smallest tasks become really, really difficult. Um, I remember at one point thinking, I don't think I showered yesterday or today. Mm. And even the realization of that, I, I couldn't, I physically couldn't get into the shower. Mm. It just felt like too much, too much effort, too much. I didn't have the physical or psychological capability mm. to get in the shower. Yeah. And I think when you're when you're in in that place of such um, extreme loss and grief, you don't have the capacity to ask no, for help or, absolutely or to say not. what you need. Yeah. And you don't know what you need. Yeah. You really, really don't. Um, I remember my mum saying at one point, sure, listen, you don't know your arse from your elbow. And I thought, I actually, <laughs> that's never been true to me as much as it is right now. I yeah. don't know what I'm doing. Mm. I don't know what I need to do. Um, I'm lucky in that my boss in work was quite understanding and I sent a text and it was very much you take as much time mm. as you need. And then I got a text back a couple of days later. I, I hope you speak to somebody mm. um, about this. Yeah. And that was very practical advice. Yeah. Um, but other than that, it was it was very, very lonely. Mm. Um, and I think that going into a pregnancy after loss, you also need support. Um, it's very, very uh, frightening. There's a lot of anxiety that goes with being pregnant after any loss. Mm. Um, and sometimes I feel so anxious and worried and it's very difficult to calm yourself down. Mm. Sometimes you just need a friend to go, all right, look, everything's going to be OK. And if it isn't, we'll deal with it. But yeah. you, you do need people around you. It's so important. Have you found now that kind of talking about this more and, and opening up about it, have you, have you noticed that people kind of reciprocate to that, you know, if, if, if you talk about it? So much. Mm. Um, so many people have said to both me and my husband, we've experienced the same thing and we felt like we had nobody to talk to and we're only able to talk about it now. And it makes me feel better to think that even if I just chat to one or two people and if they ever go on to experience it or if they've ever experienced it before at least they won't feel like they're on their own because mm. um, you do you just feel like you're so alone even when there's people around you um, it's very difficult to reach out mm. yourself so you don't know how to ask for help um, what would you say to anyone maybe who's listening to this who maybe has either experienced a similar situation with, you know, secondary infertility or someone who is unexplained or who has been experiencing pregnancy, baby loss, recurrent miscarriage? Um, I think what I clung to the most throughout all of it was trying to have even a tiny bit of hope. Things have to get better at some point. Mm. You know, even when we were in, in the depths of grief um, and my husband and I couldn't even speak about it. All I kept thinking was there there is going to be a point where I look back on this and this will have been the, the lowest part. This mm -hmm. will have been the worst part. 
our day is going to come and you know we will feel happy again um so you have to have a tiny bit of hope somewhere even if you're afraid to feel it once it's still there when you need it that's what's important mm. um we definitely were afraid to hope for a long time but it, but we still had some we still had some sort of belief that you know we're good people and we're good parents and we deserve to be parents again um i think as well what i wasn't prepared for was um people can have quite different views of secondary infertility mm. um i had a medical professional actually say to me once oh sure it's not as bad for you because you have one at home mm. and i was so proud of myself that day for being able to speak up and cuz usually i wouldn't i wouldn't be able to say anything back to that person but that day i just very calmly said well actually i don't think about it like that because i've given birth and fed my baby myself and watched her take her first steps and every time that i think about one of the four pregnancies that we've lost the four babies that we lost i think about what it would have been like with each of them and every due date that goes by or every viability day that goes by i think they might be they might be here now mm. we might be a step closer to meeting them now um i don't think that it's any easier because i have one at home i think i know what i'm missing mm. and i think that's making it a little bit harder for me right now mm. and to be fair to that person she said i i didn't think about it like mm. that and yeah i'm i'm sorry and i said no no you don't need to be sorry but it's just it's just the way that i feel about it is that i find it quite hard whether i've got a baby at home or not yeah um secondary infertility isn't spoken about as much because there is almost an idea that you should feel lucky for what you have be grateful for what you have um which is fine i'm not any less grateful for my beautiful daughter than i would have been otherwise mm. but that doesn't mean that i don't want another opportunity to be a parent yeah it doesn't mean that we don't deserve to have a bigger family yeah. um it just yeah i feel like it means almost like we really understood how important it was for us mm. to keep trying yeah and even that in itself i think it just illustrates how important it is to have these conversations you yeah know, that doctor who who said that to you which was incredibly hurtful they didn't know any better no because i'm sure they hadn't probably had that conversation no with they, too many people who had gone through it exactly i think it possibly could have been something that they just didn't think before they spoke maybe and then afterwards realized well, maybe maybe that's not true maybe it's not true for everybody yeah um there are lots of things that people deal with differently especially in the realm of fertility and IVF um i found myself that there's there's a there's a fantastic wide IVF community especially mm. online mm. um on instagram and facebook in particular i personally found it a little bit overwhelming mm. and wasn't able to really engage with that community because there was so much discussion around all of the fertility and infertility all of the IVF treatments mm. it was I found it very very overwhelming and I found that for myself I had to step away from that and it was good in a way that I learned some terminology that I maybe wouldn't have known before um and 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 it was nice to know that should I have needed to reach out to a community there were people there ready to talk about their experiences but for me I found that kind of level of thinking about it where where it's all you maybe think or th talk about every day and that you wake up every day thinking this is day whatever and I have to do this today mm -hmm. and these are the foods I'm going to eat and everything I just find that very very anxiety inducing so for me the best thing for me to do was to step back to almost compartmentalize that part to get through my medication each day I read new book I treated myself to new books each week um made sure that I was reading something um different and nice and easy that would take my mind off it lots of self care lots of baths and lots of nice food um good bit of exercise and that for me was what i needed to get mm. through um but like i say it's it's not the same for everybody and 
people don't realize how um, much IVF treatment encompasses and and how hard it can be, how grueling it can be. Um, so I found it benefited me more to kind of make sure that I felt okay in myself each day to do a little bit of self-care a little bit of looking after myself and a lot of stepping away mm. from the phone mm. um that's what I kind of found helped the most yeah. but even even that in itself is really helpful to know you know for some people listening they might be thinking oh I have to engage with all of these groups I have to be doing all my research I have you know and there is no one size fits all when it comes to fertility treatment, when it comes to loss, um, everyone experiences it differently. And I think it is really comforting when you hear someone else, yeah. you know, kind of that you can connect with and, and be like, oh yeah, I felt that, that same way. Yeah, I'm not, this isn't, you know, weird. I, I, I'm normal, that, you know, no. it's just nice to connect like that. And it doesn't mean that you're feeling things any less mm. than anybody else. It's perfectly acceptable. It's just, I felt it was almost just like another way for me to protect myself mm. to know what my boundaries were um and to be able to know myself well enough mm. to say okay I, I'm ready to talk about it with my friends I'm lucky I have a couple of really yeah. close friends that I could talk to about it if I needed to mm. um but other than that I, I didn't need those kind of supports mm. um I didn't want to be over monitoring things and that's okay it doesn't mean that you're not as worried or as committed committed yeah, yeah. yeah that's the word it doesn't mean that you're any less committed than anybody else it just means that you're doing the best thing for you at that mm. time you're just navigating it your own way and you have to you mm. have to find your own way to navigate it because it's so personal mm. everybody's journey through fertility is so personal but it also doesn't mean that you're on your own um I wish that this time last year I had heard even one person talk about secondary infertility. I'd never even heard the term. Whereas now I feel like like there are people close to us now who I know that are going through the same thing that I never would have known had I not said this is our sixth pregnancy mm. um, yeah. and we have one living baby. Yeah. So being able to say that has led to an outpouring from from some of our friends and relations and stuff to say yeah we're in the same boat and it's really rubbish sometimes that might be all they'll say but that's mm -hmm. enough for you to know that they feel comfortable enough with you to say that and that they know that you're there if they need to talk to you or if you need to talk to them um it's it's important to have open channels of communication doesn't mean you have to be texting people all day every day with an update <laughs> yeah but at least if you're having a bad day and and you you might have bad days I certainly did I don't think it's it's um abnormal in any way mm. to have to be able to say I had some really rubbish tough days during this whole infertility and IVF um journey but I can say at the end of it that I'm glad I made the decisions that I did I'm glad we started opening up and talking to our relatives and friends about it I'm really glad that we told them early on when we were pregnant in subsequent pregnancies I'm glad I've learned the term subsequent pregnancy because a lot of people are referring to this as my second pregnancy mm -hmm. and I find that quite hard mm -hmm. because I feel almost guilty like I'm doing an injustice mm -hmm. or something to to the pregnancies and babies that went before mm -hmm. um, and a colleague that I work with said who's experienced loss herself said, oh, you have a little bump and that happens in subsequent pregnancies. Mm. I'm not going to say second because it's not yours. And I thought, thank you so much for acknowledging my losses because mm. a loss is a loss. Mm. doesn't matter if it was four or five weeks or, or how long the pregnancy was. A loss is a loss. Yeah. Um, we found that out by personal experience. It didn't matter whether we lost some of our pregnancies at eight weeks or at six weeks mm. it still felt the exact same mm. so on this our subsequent pregnancy we are trying to take each day as it comes mm. and enjoy this part in as much as we can yeah. i just want to say thank you so much for um sharing this with us and you're an amazing person and I Thank you. can only wish 
amazing, boring things for this pregnancy <laughs> <laughs> that it just goes, takes along nicely. Yep. And I will be very much looking forward to seeing a picture of um, two babies. Yeah. Thank you very August. much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you.